answer was fewer clients. Less money, more attention, caring for them, caring for ourselves and the games too, just starting our lives, really. Now stay tuned for Lee Steinberg, the real Jerry Maguire. Hey, it has been a few weeks since our last episode of High Walk Clean because I've actually been very busy focused in on our new show, Walk a Mile in My Shoes. And I want to first begin by thanking all of our listeners and supporters of this show. Uh, you know, please help support Walk a Mile in My Shoes. I feel we're doing very important things, which with my co host, uh, Lona Curie, also known as the Transgender Mentor as we are working to bring understanding. Uh, it is a very controversial show because we speak about the topics that is highly recommended you don't speak about, religion, politics, hatred, racism, and we're requesting love, tolerance, kindness, and helping instead of hurting. Now, as I started our show with Tommy Chong a little while back, I am high but as I don't get high on drugs, I get high by doing what I am about to do, and that is find inspiration, excitement, and motivation by wonderful guests like I have today. This is Eric McCoy, the host of High Wall Clean. You know, having worked in the field of substance abuse treatment for almost two decades, I've worked with individuals in all walks of life. You know, as my book is titled, Pain, Failure, and Misery Are the Stepping Stones to Success, Nobody decides to get clean and or sober unless some form of suffering pulls us in. Loss, and I've kind of discussed this before, is what I believe that we are actually recovering from. I had to lose my family, my health, my freedom as I was facing a maximum of 15 years in prison, personal possessions, money. And as the first line of my book reads, I killed that motherfucker was the first thought that came to me that early morning in 2002. Who had I killed? Me. I lost myself within the horrors of meth dependency. How did I get back what I lost? Well, I had to lose what seemed to be my first real love in life, which was meth. So recently, I attended an event, the Experience Strength and Hope Awards, where I got to hear one of the honorees speak. And he wrote a book titled the agent, my 40-year career making deals and changing the game. And I got to thinking about bringing him on the show and honored that he accepted because he delivers the fight that I mentioned in my book. No matter where you've been or what you've done, you can do anything you want if you're willing to fight for it. His story inspired a movie that starred Tom Cruise. So even if you don't know the name of my guest, I am sure you have heard the name Jerry Maguire. Lee Steinberg is a sports agent. He's a philanthropist and author. He's represented, from my understanding, over 300 professional athletes in all different sports. He's also represented the number one overall pick in the NFL draft of, I guess, a record of eight times. And... From my research, he's, in, he's negotiated over $3 billion in contracts for players, including Troy Aikman and Steve Young. To go through everything that this man has done is going to take up way too much time. <laughs> but I want to mention something that I did see. As a philanthropist, he founded the Steinberg Leadership Institute, which is a program run by the Anti-Defamation League, preparing students to fight racism and inequality. Lee Steinberg is, from my picture, a go-getter. 
and some could never imagine, I think, the similarities that him and I have. Lee, I want to thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. You know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say, I, I was, wanted to do this real quick, the quote of the movie that everybody remembers, because I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times, but I'll let you give it. Cuba Gooding Jr.'s quote. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the money. There you go. <laughs> I was also thinking about the inspiration that you gave for Jerry Maguire. It actually probably now needs a part two, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, you know, High Wall Clean is based on the premise of highness isn't a property of drugs or alcohol, but instead a property of humans. And I've had great guests on this show that get high every day, not on drugs. And I can just imagine, you know, with all of your successes in the past and today through your agency and what you do, your organizations and your events, that highness is a part of you. Well, very much so in the sense I was brought up by a father who had two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to try to be an agent of change and help relieve suffering and help people who couldn't help themselves. So that um, that is my mission in life to try to make a, a meaningful difference. And uh because of alcohol, I wasn't uh, able to, to do that at a certain point. And um, I needed to break denial, understand that I had a problem, and um, engage in a, a process with a 12-step program with a unique fellowship to try and find the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a little difficult because of all the detritus and destruction uh, that that disease visited upon myself, my family, my friends. And uh, but you you have to have an epiphany somewhere that you're meant for something better. Yeah. And it's a matter to me of proportionality. I wasn't a starving peasant in Darfur. I didn't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. I wasn't sick in any way that wasn't self-induced. What excuse did I have not to live up to the uh, uh, promises and ideals that um, I had tried to maintain for so long? And so um, it, it takes work. It takes focus. And life will set you back. There are all of us are going to face reverses and face problems that seem overwhelming. So the question is not whether life will knock you back, whether life will push you into uncomfortable situations. It's how do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Can you find optimism and hope? Can you find resilience? Can you reimagine a life uh, without the substance? And can you uh, build a new platform and foundation of, uh, of spiritual fitness and the ability to, to um, maintain a program that will promote sobriety. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I can just imagine, you know, with you and I'm assuming alcohol was probably a big part of the career you have. I'm, I'm assuming there was a lot of drinking. It, it was, uh, our field really is the Disneyland of drinking. I mean, it's uh, a wash in alcohol and every event has alcohol. Every game is a luxury box with the finest alcohol. Every banquet, every uh, uh, get together is all alcohol fueled. But I really didn't start drinking so heavily until late in my life, and it was 61 years of age, I crashed. And part of what occasioned it was that not anything had worked, because I understand I'll walk in the office every day, and notwithstanding our most rigorous attempts to anticipate problems or our best efforts to, to accomplish goals, something will go awry. Mm -hmm. And and you just have to have that expectation. But in my personal life, 
My dad died a long death from cancer, and I felt helpless to save him. It was probably grandiosity to think I would have any impact over that, but um, I'd always been brought up in a way where my dad would look at me and say, when you're waiting for someone to solve a problem or fix a wrong, and you wait for they or them to do it, the amorphous they, older people, political figures, he would say you could wait forever. The they is you, son. You are the they. So somehow I had the feeling I was responsible for uh, somehow curing my father. Then my two boys suffered an eye disease, retinitis pigmentosa, which starts with night blindness, (coughs) excuse me, and leads to a narrowing of the visual field. So they're both blind. Mm. And I felt helpless. Uh, to to prevent that. And then we lost a home in a beachside city here in Newport Beach to to mold. And so it was like a cataclysm of events. And uh, eventually um, I felt like, you know, Job, that there were locusts Mm -hmm. and river of blood and what was next. Mm -hmm. And I turned to the wrong thing. I turned to alcohol to sort of numb and escape from uh, that reality. And um, so it was that confluence of events that um, sort of pushed me. And then when I separated with my wife, I was in my own apartment for the first time. And I found out there was that it was legal to consume alcohol in the light of day. Mm. So I had been a late night drinker and all of a sudden I could get a high alcohol content going. And before I knew it, my brain had been altered in a way where any kind of alcohol triggered a craving response. And um, I couldn't, um, my, my rational self couldn't stop it. So you were almost like the, the fixer, like you had to fix everything, but unable to do that. It sort of let you down, I'm assuming. And, um, and then you obviously also got into alcohol and you couldn't fix that either. Well, it's like in Pavlov's experiment, he shocks the dog a number of times and then Pavlov walks into the room and the dog just lays over, uh, Mm -hmm. anticipating it. And I got to the point where all that energy and optimism and, and sense of balance and understanding of life's blessings had left me. Mm -hmm. And it was foreboding and darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed to to find a root. And, 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 you know, for anyone who's out there struggling, despondent over problems with addiction um, and starting to feel hopeless, don't lose hope. There are 12-step programs with unique fellowships. Um, You don't have to do this alone. You can be surrounded by a group of people who understand, who, who have brains that have been altered the same way, yeah. and uh, they will help you get through it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of people probably, I mean, couldn't imagine, you know, being as successful as you were, you know, living a life that some would probably call a dream, you know, and then losing everything. That, that's what really got me when I heard you that night. Um, you know, I'd seen Jerry Maguire, but I, I mean, so many years ago <laughs> that uh, <clears throat> I didn't even really remember it. But, um, but what really got me, though, was that, that, you know, you, you know, obviously knowing, obviously, that you were very successful and then to, to go to that place of losing everything, you know, Um, Well, the worst in some ways was that at the end of life, what do you have? You have what you gave back to the greater good, and you have the quality of the relationships that you have. Were you a good father? Were you a good son? Were you a good brother? Uh, Were you a friend to people at times when it was inconvenient to be a friend, when they really needed you? Um, And that's all we'll leave life with. And our practice was fundamentally put together on the concept of the athlete as role model. So I would have them retrace their roots to the high school community, set up a scholarship fund, boys and girls club to the collegiate community, 
and repay or endow a, a scholarship. And then at the pro level, get the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders on a board that would execute a program. So running back work done is just put the 175th single mother and her uh, family in the first home she'll ever own by making the down payment and uh, outfitting the home. So it's athletes changing lives. And all of a sudden, I wasn't doing the the philanthropic training programs I used to, to fund. I wasn't able to help the athletes do it. And then um, I was uh, not available for my own children. And mm-hmm. kids don't ask to be born. Um, they don't apply for, for uh, citizenship. We bring them on the earth with the implied obligation that you will give your kids stability and, and a sense of uh, unquestioned love. And all of a sudden, it was clear to me I had just dropped out of that uh, equation. So the fact I closed my business um, after I've now done this for 47 years, that I closed my business, closed my home, went back and lived with my parents was sort of uh, the apocalypse. Hmm. And, um, but the real comeback in this is not the fact that we now have a practice that represents uh, the most valuable player in football, Patrick Mahomes, or a series of quarterbacks, or that um, this business is totally returned. It's not that. The comeback is having been able to maintain sobriety for these last years and being a good father and a good friend again. Yeah. And that's uh, what what I had lost. Uh, the material things are just things and they're replaceable, but the relationships and the sense of uh, trying to see problems in the world and, and be the solution was what I had dropped out of. And um, um, thank goodness uh, uh, I stumbled into a 12-step program. Yeah. You know, I teach, I teach at a school. I also do uh, counseling, you know, at a treatment program and, you know, I teach success and, you know, success means something so different to so many different people. You know, I'm far from wealthy, but I feel I am very successful. You know, I feel, um, you know, very successful in the fact that, you know, I reach out and I work to help people just like you. I mean, and that is, you know, the most important, it almost sounds a little bit too, that with your alcohol and you had had mentioned one of the things about what your dad always said, you know, family, that you sort of broke that rule and that probably impacted you a lot. My only thought in life when I was sitting on my deceased father's bed in our West Los Angeles home, and I had been reduced to, to that was where I could find more vodka. And so there were no other thoughts in my mind. It was just, how could I find more? How could I uh, put together the change in my pocket to buy uh, the next bottle? And um, I found myself at one point sitting in the park in West Los Angeles where I had uh, played as a kid. And I'm sitting on a bench drinking and um, where had life gone? Um, I had totally uh, divorced myself from everything and, and, you know, was in isolation. Now, fortunately, I had a group of loving and warm friends who cared and, and took me off to sober living. And, um, and I spent nine months in sober living and got a little bit of my bearings back and, and got the support of, of, uh, the group and, and it, uh, um, and if I play my cards right and do the right things, uh, in March, I'll turn 12 years sober. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, the, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, you know, no matter where you've been or what you've done, you can do anything you want if you're willing to fight for it. And that's kind of what I see with you. I mean, I, I see you as, as a fighter. And, 
I know that I'm sure you've lost a lot of trust with a lot of people during the time that you sort of closed everything down. And I was kind of curious on that. How did you gain that trust back? So look, I'm in a business where we take young men off a college campus. They go through a scouting process. They um, get drafted into pro sports. And then you need to mentor them into their career, help them with a charitable uh, uh, foundation, and then help plan for second career. So the point is, I don't have a divine right to represent athletes. And I have to be brutally honest with myself about the questions that I would face. Number one, how can you tell us that you're going to stay sober? And the answer is there are no guarantees and you can't tell someone honestly that you've got it this time, this time it's under control. I'm still a bun in the oven cooking. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is while well, you've been out of this for a while, you know, do you still have relationships and contacts? <clears throat> the third thing was you didn't do a very good job uh, running your own money. You know, how can you run ours? Well, the truth is, is that we use financial planners, so I'm not directly involved in that. Um, and um, uh, do you still have relationships uh, left in the pros? And fortunately, um, uh, no one really abandoned me and uh, uh, people kept reaching out throughout and a whole series of people throughout the world of sports reached out to me unsolicited and uh, with, with really supportive messages. Mm -hmm. And so, the, but I had to be um, uh, realistic about the challenges that I faced. Could I come back into a young person's business um, with the same effectiveness? And uh, uh, we were fortunate to, to sign some players. And then Patrick Mahomes, who we represent, was MVP of the league the first year uh, in the NFL and won the Super Bowl the year following. And so we had, in many ways, the most valuable player in, in football. And that led to, to others and eventually go back into baseball and basketball. And then um, I'm writing... Uh, uh, a third book uh, that will be a follow-up to the agent and, and getting ready to do my own podcast, not to compete with you, of course, oh, no. but, <laughs> um, uh, but um, and your whole concept of fighting is that um, do you want to live effectively? Do you want to, to make an impact in the world? Yeah. Um, and, so the point is, but who was I fighting? As you said in your lead, I was fighting myself. Yeah. And uh, there was no, <laughs> the greatest opponent was internal yeah. because you carry this disease around with you. And once you realize that it, it's going to be with you for life. And so the question is, how can you uh, live with uh, honor and dignity and 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 having a positive impact. Um, so basically, if the only thing that I'm, I can't do in the world is drink, it leaves about a trillion things that you can do, yeah. a trillion things that, that uh, bring fun and you just have to redefine fun. You know, yeah. fun, fun is not uh, uh, going off into la la land. You know, fun is real life. I mean, it, you know, it's real fun. I mean, that's the thing, you know, in sobriety. I mean, I remember during my drug use, like I didn't laugh, you know, the laughter you have is just, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And, you know, I had, I had an experience. I had um, originally gotten clean in 2002. Uh, it was January 3rd, 2002. I was after my fourth arrest of in a six month period. And that's where I was looking at a lot of time in, in prison um, and then I got clean and I fought it and I, I had, you know, um, I became, you know, I went to school, I became a, a counselor, program director, clinical director. I owned a program and I was, I mean, in my eyes, I was successful. I was very successful in what I did and I loved and I had passion and excitement for it. 
But that wasn't the end of my story. And in 2013, I lost my passion and I relapsed. And it was a six month run that I went on. It almost died, you know, as a result of it. Um, luckily for the first time in my life, I ended up back in rehab without having to get arrested. <laughs> um, because, you know, you talk about that change in your brain, the changes that happen, you know, the, the feeling that it's a necessity, you know, the, between a rock and a hard place, you know, like I want to stop because it's going to kill me. But I also feel and truly believe that if I, that it's going to kill me if I do stop. And, you know, I would battle that, you know, methamphetamine being my drug of choice. And, um, and that passion, you know, was, was the thing that I lost. Um, but you see, hearing that, you're an inspiration to me because it makes clear that notwithstanding how many years of sobriety you had, um, that uh, it's possible to relapse. And forgetting that we're alcoholic is one of the great dangers because it's that close if you're not focused to to just falling back into it and so your story helps me because it uh, reminds me that uh, of the need to be vigilant mm -hmm. and how even someone that seems to have it all down and is working the program can, can, can lapse. Yeah. And um, my understanding of alcoholism is that the way it changes the brain is that all of the autonomic responses that your body has, you know, you need to eat, you know, you need to defecate, you know, you want to make, you know, you want to have to breathe the brain becomes confused and the amygdala gets impacted. And what happens is that the need to have that drink becomes conflated with, with breath itself, yep. with, with the most primary autonomic needs. And so you jump over the prefrontal lobe that has um, a decision-making and judgment and balance and the rest of it. And you jump into the amygdala and so cravings, and I remember those nights where I would pull up to my condo and I'd say, you know, tonight I'm not going to drink. And somehow 10 minutes later, my car had magically piloted itself to the liquor store. And I was back in my uh, apartment with a big bottle of vodka. Now, how did that happen? I wasn't, I, I, I sat as you talked about, like the devil and angel in an old Walt Disney cartoon, you know, on Donald's shoulders. Um, uh, I had, I knew I wasn't going to drink that night. I was not going to drink. I had made that decision. And yet somehow, um, uh, in spite of that, now I ask you, if behind door A is spiritual fitness, respect, being surrounded by friends and family, professional success, reputation, and behind door two is physical uh, uh, illness, um, loss of reputation, loss of freedom, loss of finances, loss of everything. Who willingly would pick door two? No one. No one. But that's what our brains uh, tell us is the right thing to do. Yeah, the, you know, the amygdala is in the survival part of the brain, you know, the old part, you know, I talk about the old and the new part of the brain. lizard brain. Yep. And, yep. and it does, and it shuts off the, the cognitive decision making, you know, the, the love, the decency, the morality. I mean, that's the dangers behind it. You know, you talk about door number two, I mean, all of your you know, love, you lose, love is no longer in the equation. You know, when we're on drugs, you know, we say we love our kids, we love this, we love that. But none of that's in the equation anymore. I loved alcohol. Exactly. And that's what my primary relationship was with alcohol. Yep. And so it supplanted this enormously charmed life and reduced me to, you know, sitting on that park bench. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, that that Beelzebub and benefactor, <laughs> the devil and the kindly helper, you know, and and that was, you know, I I, I battled. It was, it was really crazy. And I think about this, you know, when I made that relapse, you know, was that I I thought I spent about thirty minutes going back and forth. You know, I had a I had a bowl of meth, <laughs> you know, and I kept thinking like. Oh, come on. You can just take one hit. No big deal. And then the other side's going, dude, you're crazy, man. There's no way you can do that. You can't handle that. You know, it's like, oh, nah, I think I can, I, you know, it'll be different this time, you know, <laughs> and just back and forth. And, and uh, you know, and it, and it is the only way that you can choose that door number two is you have to figure out a way for it to make sense. You know, that rationalizing, manipulating yourself. Um, and that's what I saw with most people that do relapse, you know, is that I can just take one, I have to forget the powerlessness, you know, we say, well, I'm 80% powerless, which of course leaves me with 20% power. And of course the alcoholic and the addicts going to st stick with the power, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's what I believe. I mean, I truly believe just like you're saying that, you know, if, if I believe I am 100% powerless while on the substance, I'll never use again because nobody's going to rationally choose door number two. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, that doesn't make any sense. So what people who have not been addicted don't understand is that for me, there's no off button. Yep. So that once... I have that first drink of alcohol. It's like, wow, I'm in a good place now. Let's keep this up. Yeah. And at that point, there's no decision making. So that you get to the point where uh, a normal brain will start to feel a little too high and push it back. Yeah. And our brain is, oh my God, somebody left half a. A uh, glass of, of, of wine on that table. How did they not drink that? Right. You know, how can I drink that? Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for saying that too. I mean, one of the, one of the big things that I, reasons I do this show is number one is to help break the stigma of substance abuse. I mean, that's to me a big fight because, you know, we're not bad people. I mean, that's the premise, you know, like while clean and sober, you know, I, I mean, with all the people I work with, you know, good majority are smart, you know, they're, they're genuine, they're, they're caring, they have integrity, you know, um, all of those things while sober. And then, yes, you take that substance and then all of a sudden we look evil. We look like we hate everybody, but it's not really us. That's why I was saying, you know, with the beginning of my book, I killed that motherfucker. I mean, that was, you know, for me, that was. <laughs> You know, I, I lost myself. I was no longer, I mean, I took that one hit. I mean, I went from integrity, caring, I had morals, I had values. I had all this stuff. I took that one hit. Dr. Jekyll became Mr. Hyde. You know, it was, it was that quick. And now you help save people's lives. That's what I, what I, you know, I, I, I hope them save their life. I understand. But the reality is that without intervention, we keep hitting bottoms. Mm -hmm. And we think that's the worst circumstances we'll ever have without realizing that things can get worse. Things can get much worse. It can always get worse. And... Every person has to find their particular set of circumstances that are so anathema to everything they are that they simply can't maintain that drunken lifestyle anymore. Yeah. And when you get to that point, um, then you're open and willing to do a little bit of work. And uh, I just felt when I went back to rehab and and sober living, I was going back to college and I used every and 
And I thought there were some lecturers that I've found in meetings that, that had a variety of insights that were important. Um, so if I just listened to them and modeled myself after what they did, um, because I'd always been the expert in life. Everyone relied on me for problem solving and advice, a whole range of people in the world. Uh, both in my profession and private life. But now I reached a field where I was abysmally ignorant and had no understanding of anything. So, um, you know, when you're in a process of perpetual relapse, there's a tendency to tell everybody each time, oh, I have it this time. I got it. I got the formula. I, I'm doing it's going to be different this time. And this time, I didn't say a thing other than days, how many days of sobriety had stacked up and then months and then ultimately years. And uh, other than that, um, I still view myself as a bun in the oven, still cooking in sobriety. And I'll probably be in that oven until the day I exit this mortal coil. And that's the, you know, you hear people all the time. Oh my God, I got to do this. You know, like people are like 12 step program. I got to do this the rest of my life. Yeah. You got to, you get to improve yourself, become better and you get to learn to love yourself better and have higher self-esteem for the rest of your life. (laughs) Right. And I've got my kids back in a great relationship with a woman. And I've got a a practice that's once again, uh, uh, you know, top and all the rest of it. Um, but again, what I mostly have is uh, um, peace of mind back. And to get up this morning and wake up rather than come to and not have to remember. <laughs> there used to be days where I'd wake up feeling great. And then people would tell me stories of what I might have done or said the night before. And, uh, oh my goodness. And so, and today you you can wake up and, uh, and get excited about the new day. And, um, and you know that there's nothing that happened in the past 24 hours that, that, uh, you're not aware of. Yeah, I get it. I get I get excited, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I always have, that's when I always have the most energy too. But, you know, I get excited about, I don't know what today's going to bring. And I feel that, you know, I don't know what today's going to bring. And then I meet you, you know, I mean, I literally this, you know, my life always sort of evolves and around to, you know, some of the coolest stuff, you know, um, and I love the people I meet. I love, you know, doing the show. I've had such great guests on this show. Um, that have, you know, such powerful stories. And I think you definitely have an amazing story. Well, thanks. And thanks for um, having me on and kudos to you for the good work you do. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you. I want to ask you real quick. And I always ask everybody this, um, if you had a message to those out there suffering, and I know you kind of said something before, but um, what would you tell them? Don't despair because there's light at the end of this tunnel. Hmm. And if, um, um, and I had been reduced to only thinking about where I could find more alcohol. And um, today life's much happier. Hmm. And there's a formula which involves a 12 step program with a unique fellowship that you can become involved in and do this with the help of very supportive people. And uh, what is so much darkness today can lead to resplendent sunlight in the future and peace of mind and happiness. And it's as simple as taking that one step and being willing to, to look for change. And change is possible. It's not hopeless. Yep. Just join us in the uh, lightness of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, life can get good. I mean, if you if you were to say real quick, um, what has sobriety brought you? Um, my life back. Very simply, it's um, um, brought me back uh, a peace of mind, a 
um, relationship with the higher power, a, a, the ability to, to be a good father and a, and, and a good friend and good in a romantic relationship and the ability to, to um, uh, be back in a profession I love and the ability to, at the end of the day, see problems and hardship in the world and think of ways to alleviate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for doing this. But uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning into another episode of High Walk Clean. Keep getting high, but let's do it clean. I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.